etc. And all of a sudden, it puts in a T next to a T. What does it do? Does it just keep saying, ah, oh, well, I make one error, I just keep going on and do my thing? It turns out, no, it doesn't. When it makes that error, it stops. Okay? And it stops because that T, and here's a T up on the top strand. It doesn't have to be TT. It could be GG or uh, uh, GT or something like that. Just anything that's not properly paired. If it's not properly paired, we can imagine that instead of sitting flat, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stick out like that. So it's mispaired. That base is sitting there, not, not sitting properly. That's actually a cue to the DNA polymerase to stop. Well, it stopped, but ideally what you would like is for the polymerase to fix the mistake that it just made. Okay? And it turns out that's one of the activities that the DNA polymerase has. Okay? So what happens when it gets to that point is it says, oops, made an error. I'm going to back up. And when I back up, I'm going to peel away this bottom strand. So I've got a little bit of it loose that I can work with. So it backs up and peels away a little bit of this bottom strand. And then there's an activity called the 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease. I'm going to explain that to you. First of all, I've been going in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction forwards. I've just described to you that I've got to go backwards to get rid of it. I start backing up. I'm going 3' prime to 5' prime, right? The, nucle the nuclease is an enzyme that destroys phosphodiester bonds. It's going to take out bases, uh, take out nucleotides. All right, so what's it going to do? It's going to start chewing the end of that. It might chew back for two or three to make sure it got the one that was necessary, and now it's going to go forwards again. So one of the, the catalytic activities of DNA polymerase one is what's called a three prime to five prime exonuclease activity. It's also called proofreading, like a copy editor. It's proofreading what it has just made. That proofreading function gives the DNA polymerase about a hundredfold greater accuracy than if it doesn't have that. So it's on the order of 10 million instead of being, say, 100, 000, one error in 100,000. If it didn't have that, that proofreading activity, it's going to make about one error in 100,000. One error in 100,000 is still pretty good, but it's not as good as one in 10 million. Question? No, it does, it, it, the question is, would it use the DNA polymerase 2 to re-go over that? And no, it doesn't. DNA polymerase 2 is, appears to be pretty much exclusively involved in repairing damage. And we'll, I'll just briefly mention damage later. Okay? Yes? Uh, so the, you said 1 in 10 million errors. Is that the errors that it doesn't fix? So about 1 in 10 million errors are ones that escape and make it, make it through the whole thing. So it's not perfect, but 1 in 10 million is still pretty remarkable. It's making errors more frequently than that, but it's catching them such to the extent that only one in 10 million escapes this scrutiny. But good question. OK. So proofreading is a very important function. We talk about HIV being a very difficult virus for us to treat, because once we get a drug that effectively treats HIV, over time, the drug, uh, the, the, the virus evolves uh, a resistance to that drug. How does it evolve the resistance to that? Through mutation. And how does mutation happen? Through errors in replication. It turns out that HIV's um, reverse transcriptase, which is their DNA polymerase, does not have a 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease activity. It does not proofread its own message that it makes. Okay? Most reverse transcriptases, that is enzymes that copy RNA into DNA, most reverse transcriptases do not have a 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease activity. They do not proofread. If they make errors, maybe we make a better virus. A viral lifestyle is very different than a cellular lifestyle. In a multicellular organism, mutations translate to cancer. In a viral world, mutations translate to resistance. OK? All right. So I said that DNA polymerase 1 has three catalytic activities. I've told you two. I've told you it's got a polymerase, and it's got a proofreading activity. What's the third one? Well, the third one turns out to be a very important and a very essential function, and it's called a 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease. Now, I haven't told you why it's going to need that, 
But you could think about this as, let's say that here comes my RNA polymerase. It's making, it's making, it's making, it's making. And all of a sudden, it encounters a strand that's already been made ahead of it. Okay, you with me? So I've got this gap, come all the way up to the gap, and now there's a strand ahead of me. What the five prime to three prime can do is it can start chewing up this strand ahead of it. You envision this so far? It's chewing up the strand ahead of it. The question is how and why. Not how, but why. All right? That is due to one thing that I haven't told you yet about DNA replication. So you got the idea in mind about what it's doing. It's chewing up the strand ahead of it. Have we got that? OK. Well, why? Well, it turns out that when we replicate DNA, DNA polymerases need several things. First of all, they need to have what we call DNTPs. They need to have DATP, DGTP, DCTP, DTTP, right? Because those are the building blocks for making the polymerase. They've got to have a strand that they're copying, right? It can't just start assembling them randomly. It has to have something that it's copying. It needs to know this. There's a T, OK, I'm going to put in an A. There's a C, I'm going to put in a G, et cetera. It has to have this strand to copy. So those are essential things for a DNA polymerase to have. Now, the third thing that a DNA polymerase has is something that it needs to have. is something that's called a primer. A primer. Now, I don't have a board here that I could, so I've got to, let me, let me show you um, a figure for this. OK, so I've got to have a primer to start synthesis of a strand let's say I have a single one single strand of DNA that's here in front of me between my fingers a single strand no duplex no nothing if I take this single strand and I add DNA polymerase to it and I add the four DNTPs to it nothing will happen nothing now, that tells us that there's something additional that's needed for DNA polymerase to happen. And what's needed is what's called a primer. A primer is a short stretch of a nucleotide, or a, of a, not a nucleotide, a short stretch of nucleotides that are base paired to the existing strand. So now I want you to think back. I've got my single strand. And on the end, I've got something that's about 20 nucleotides long that's base paired at the end. It's got a, three, a free 3 prime hydroxyl, because that's where replication is going to start. And when I have that, and I put the polymerase and the four DNTPs together, I see replication happens. So all DNA polymerases require what's called a primer. You have to have the primer. Well, that's fine and dandy, but then if all DNA polymerases have to have a primer, that makes it kind of hard to make the primer with a DNA polymerase, doesn't it? Because a primer has to start somewhere. And if it's only starting from a pre-existing structure, how do I get the thing on there? Right? There's a problem. It turns out that cells solve that problem by using an RNA primer. So the primer that DNA polymerases use is actually made by an enzyme called primase. Primase, what it will do is it will synthesize a short piece of RNA that's base paired to the end of my DNA. The RNA polymerase gets out, the, the primase gets out of the way, and now here's this duplex that's down here. The DNA polymerase says, oh, there's a primer, and it goes and it extends from that point. That's all fine and dandy, except for now we've got a duplex DNA, 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 RNA, DNA. The end of it is RNA DNA. How do I get rid of the RNA? Now you're starting to see where the 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease comes in. Okay? Every Okazaki fragment, for example, starts with an RNA, and then DNA goes from it. Then there's a gap, and then RNA, and then DNA goes from it. Let's imagine we're between two of those RNA, uh, those Okazaki fragments. This is where DNA polymerase 1 comes in. DNA polymerase 1 comes in and says, OK, there's a gap. I'm going to fill in this gap because I'm good at filling in these small things. So here I've got RNA DNA. Okay, Polymerase 1 comes at the end of the DNA and says, OK, I'm going to, I'm going to replicate, replicate, replicate. Oops, here's an RNA. Now my 5 prime to 3 prime is going to chew it out until I get to DNA sequence, 
and then it's going to stop. So now it chews it out and, and synthesizes DNA at the same time. So now when it's done, all I have are two uh, nucleotides immediately adjacent to each other that haven't been joined together. The last step in the process to join those together involves an enzyme called ligase that now joins them. And now I've got DNA, 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 DNA. What about the very end? What about the very end? Well, it turns out in E. coli, they don't have ends. One of the reasons they have a circular chromosome is they come back to where they started. If I start with, for example, that leading strand, the leading strand starts with one RNA primer. It goes all the way around, and it comes back around, and all of a sudden now it hits that RNA primer. Polymerase 3 falls off, polymerase 1 comes on, and it fills in that gap. Pretty cool. All the Okazakis are taken care of in that way as well. There's, by the time replication is done, there is no RNA left. It's fully duplex DNA. The vast majority of the nucleotides that are in it came from polymerase 3, and all that polymerase 1 did was it filled in those little gaps and removed those little RNAs that were necessary for primers throughout the molecule. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Yes, sir? So it's, it's going to be copying a top strand, and it, there's no end to that one. Remember, that, that one's just going all the way across the room, like I said. So it's, it's, it's not gonna, there's no end to drop off. Only the one that's being made has an end. Okay? Other questions about that? Now, you think about this, that DNA replication is a little machine that's doing all this thing. We're going to encounter other examples this term where we see proteins literally doing the work of a little factory. It's a little machine that's going on. And again, I want you to look at these videos because you'll be amazed at what some of these proteins are doing. All right. So this is a picture of the replication fork that shows the involvement of some of the proteins. I've talked about some of them, but I haven't talked about all of them. So here's DNA ligase. If you recall, I said it's going to join together those DNAs next to DNAs and close up that gap so that they're one contiguous piece. DNA polymerase 1 is filling in those gaps and getting rid of the RNA primers. Okay. Um, the uh, DNA polymerase uh, 3 is here, and it's got something called a beta clamp. Okay, A beta clamp. I'm going to tell you, what, I'm going to show you a picture of the beta clamp in a second. But the beta clamp is a critical subunit of the DNA polymerase 3. It turns out DNA polymerase 3 has great quaternary structure. There's about 10 different proteins that come together and make a complex that perform the functions of DNA polymerase 3. One of those proteins is called beta. And beta is pretty remarkable. Let me show you a figure first. Okay, The beta clamp looks like this. Now, it's a little hard to see in this figure, but the white in this figure is the DNA. The beta clamp is a ring around that DNA. So we could think of the DNA being my finger and the ring being the ring that I have right here. We could think of the, DNA, the rest of the DNA polymerase being attached where my hand is. What is the beta clamp doing? It is holding that DNA, that, that DNA polymerase 3 onto the DNA so the DNA polymerase 3 does not fall off. DNA polymerase 3 differs from DNA polymerase 1 in that, remember I said DNA polymerase 1 is good for short stretches of, of making DNA? The reason why is it falls off. It doesn't have a beta clamp. DNA polymerase 3, once it gets on, it's there for the whole ride, all the way around. Okay? That's made possible by the beta clamp. If we look in our cell,